Good morning. Welcome to the International Wolf Center. And my name is Laura Schmidt, the Wolf Curator. And this is a Friday feature webinar that we've been doing since we've been closed to the public during the pandemic. And you are now viewing the exhibit pack. And what's going on right now is your typical morning ritual for wolf care. Uh, we have staff in the pack holding area uh, doing some raking and uh, picking up scat. Um, Grizzer there uh, had breakfast already this morning and he's just kind of following around uh, the staff, helping them work and uh, keeping an eye on things. Since I last had a broadcast, Grizzer uh, reminded us that he is uh, still a wolf who has capabilities of making our life a little bit challenging. Um, he actually uh, tore off a panel in this uh, pup area, and that was to protect him from the exhibit pack so that they couldn't accidentally grab a nose or, you know, get a little excited um, towards him. Uh, we have it designed for pups, and uh, we let Grizzer use it, and uh, lo and behold, uh, maybe Grizzer watched his birthday webinar where I showed him um, destroying a hut. Uh, but the reality is that um, even at 16, he can cause a little damage. So he tore off a panel. So now we have a metal uh, fence panel that keeps him back at least another eight inches away from that wood. So we are, um, again, reminded that wolves um, are not dogs and they have the capability of investigating things. And I think some people have been telling me they've been hearing on the camera a lot of pawing and a lot of fence kind of slapping and that's Grizzer and the pack um, interacting. And so uh, to me, it's a great thing for Grizzer to have that kind of stimuli. He is not concerned one bit about those wolves over on the other side. Matter of fact, I think he wants to join them. It is not in his best interest in his health uh, to join them, but um, he um, has no problem standing face to face with them and uh, pawing back at them and uh, kind of interacting. So I think it's been good for him mentally to have that stimuli. Again, we always wanna make sure that our facility is safe. You see a lot of rock, you see a lot of concrete, thanks to the Working for Wolves crew who hauled all those rocks and did all that concrete work to make these dens. But you also see, again, fences, wood that's protected by fences to be able to keep um, everybody safe so that there's no uh, situation where, you know, uh, where they can get at um, the wood. The wood barrier is a very important thing here. And I'll talk a little bit about yesterday, a circumstance where we uh, had a medical exam for the exhibit pack. So we had the cameras down for the, well, I'd say, what did we start? Uh, 6.45, we started. I think I turned the cameras off right away in the morning. And then um, we took, basically the procedure was, uh, we took uh, the exhibit pack, brought them into this pack holding area. We moved Axel and Grayson into the building and drug them out of view. Uh, of Denali and Bolts. Um, so again, we were very conscientious about uh, who got uh, mobilized and who witnessed the immobilization so that we wouldn't put uh, an individual wolf in a circumstance of being weaker or being um, kind of vulnerable because they were um, seen in a, in a position of going down into uh, a chemical mobilization. So basically, X and Grayson were done first. They were done in the building. And then we were joined uh, by uh, one of our veterinarians and uh, our two uh, instructors at the community college for the vet tech program. Uh, Jess, Hine, uh, uh, sorry, Jess Kynes and um, Allison Hill came over and they did uh, the kind of the medical work for Axel and Grayson right behind this shed. So basically they were um, stretchered out the back door. They uh, were put on tables, try to keep people six feet away, walking outside. And uh, they actually did their exam right out back. So again, a wood barrier, Denali's actually in here. I'm gonna turn off a mic here for a second. Thank you, sorry, <laughs> lots of background noise here today. So Denali was actually in the medical pack, or in the pack holding area. Um, so he did not see uh, the wolves go down. He did not see them stretchered. Grizzer was on the east side. That's in the back habitat here, or, or, or passed through the transition area on the east side. 
And then Bolts was also in this pack holding area. As soon as we got the Ardix drugged, we came out and drugged Bolts. And Bolts had to go to the vet clinic. He actually had a circumstance, and let me show you on the screen. Uh, Bolts had to go to the vet clinic, and um, hopefully you're seeing this. This is a image of uh, Bolts with his uh, jaw open. You can see a little bit of tartar. He's eight. Um, we, we're bound to have a little bit of tartar in some of the older animals. But you can see this red spot on his gum. Uh, that is concerning to us. That's a, not a normal gum color that shows a little bit of inflammation there. Uh, so we took both to the clinic to have that checked out. They also checked out his throat um, to see if there was anything causing that high pitch um, uh, circumstance where he couldn't, he doesn't have vocals at a high pitch. And we've, uh, We've experienced that with our older animals, um, not with Grizzer, but with Shadow, um, who lost his ability to do high-pitched howls as he aged. Bolts was only eight, so it's very unusual. And this has been going on for over a year, so it's very unusual for him to have that. The good news is there's no mass in his throat. There's nothing on his vocal cords that's causing an external pressure that might be weakening his vocal cords. Um, the concerning news is that we still don't have an answer. Um, and then we also, they also did a biopsy of this uh, gum to be able to determine if, in fact, there, you know, what that is. And so we're waiting on news on that. Um, there's a couple of scenarios, but we certainly don't want to uh, make any kind of reference to what uh, might be uh, without any knowledge about what's going on. So uh, anyway, so then basically Denali was the last wolf to be drugged. He did go down to the clinic. Dinelli had several biopsies done. He has a lot of masses, really small, uh, pea-sized masses. He's got a bigger lump on his left side. We wanted to x-ray his hips. So he went down to the clinic. He had a lot of different biopsies taken. We're waiting on sampling. Um, and he took the longest to come out of drug. Part of the issue is when you immobilize, you know, younger animals obviously metabolize drugs a little bit differently. Older animals, especially older animals with a lot of body fat, uh, which is Denali, um, can have some absorption issues a little bit differently. So we were a little concerned about how he was going to come out of the, out of the drug. Uh, we uh, basically, when we do an immobilization, we can't just pull one wolf out and then have the other wolves um, you know, accept them back in. Uh, the whole concept of dispersing is a wolf pack leaves its territory and then, uh, you know, uh, may join up with another mate and may start another territory and literally may become a different pack. And so there's this mentality, even in captivity for short medical exams, where they will find uh, that the wolf pack just rejects an animal if you don't bring them in. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you just take one out and then, and then bring it back in. So there's a lot of concerns about that. So anyway, so we, um, the way we did, after we got everybody done, you know, Axel and Grayson went to the back habitat, which is out of camera view, way in the back. Uh, they hung out back there. They got a reversal. So the drugs that we're using are completely reversible. They were up and around um, for several hours. They sat back there till about mm, almost two o'clock. And then... Um, uh, we're ready to go out, but we put Denali and Bolts out first. We put them out at noon because we wanted them to be in the pack and, and have the younger ones who are more likely to put pressure in the test. We wanted the younger ones to be coming into the pack with the older ones already in, in place. And so the only concern was is that because Denali had so much extra body fat, he was not, and, and, and plus Bolts and, and Denali were under gas as well. So it wasn't just like our immobilization to do the survey and reverse them. Um, they were, you know, they were down on the table. They had x-rays, they had uh, biopsies, they had, you know, issues. And so they had more chemical on board. So they were slower to come out of it. So what we did was we put Denali and Bolts back in at noon um, they hung around. Bolts actually didn't want to come out of the medical pen. We opened up the door and he decided to stay in. So he, I think he was concerned where Axel was. Once he figured out Axel wasn't in there, he came out. He kind of hung out with Denali. And then at two o'clock, we brought Axel and Grayson back in. I was concerned about Grayson, who has an issue with Denali. And so we did get Grayson uh, an extra dose of Valium, just an oral tablet of Valium right before I came out just to give about three or four hours of a little bit more sleepiness for, for Grayson. 
And uh, then uh, we reunited them. Um, staff then took shifts, uh, two hour shifts, to be able to monitor them um, through the evening until a thunderstorm hit. And we all know those of us who worked around wolves for a while, they kind of hunker down. Uh, we had our first thunderstorm of the year, so things were calm. Um, Bolts' confidence is kind of rattled. Uh, he's still not feeling like he was uh, pre the exam. So when you have a wolf who has a little bit of a weak social bond to begin with, doesn't has some trust issues. I um, um, I, I I don't know how to solve that for him. I mean, I wish I could communicate, you know, as a human and say it's going to be okay. I can't. So I have to work with him and try to figure out what makes him comfortable, what makes him confident, and, and try to make sure that we can kind of overcome some of the, that anxiety. Part of that anxiety is keeping Axel under control, keeping Axel distracted so he doesn't focus on bolts so much. Denali, and this is the challenge that I have, is Denali, even though they give him grief, and he did have a bite wound when he went to the clinic on his back leg that was recent, even though they give him grief, He's right there. He is wagging his tail. He is shoulder to shoulder. This morning he had an Arctic sandwich and he was in the middle. Um, he had one Arctic on either side. He was wagging his tail. He has no problem being here. He wants to be uh, part of this pack. And that's really important for me to try to uh, interpret is, you know, how is the compatibility? Uh, because life in retirement is not the greatest option for wolves. You know, solitary issues. I, I feel for Grizzer. I don't have any choices for him. He can't be with these younger ones. He just, his body just couldn't take it. Um, but I worry about that solitude. Wolves are pack animals. That's who they are. That's how they are. And that's something that I think is really important for us to always recognize. So when we isolate them and make the decision to isolate them, we have to make sure that that's the right decision. So I'm watching that very carefully. Certainly the vets would like me to get more weight off of Denali. He is carrying a lot more weight and that's going to be hard on his joints. But it's hard to do um, to get a wolf to lose weight when that wolf is food possessive and controls everything you put in there. And so we're, we're having discussions right now about how do we manage carcass feedings? Um, how do we manage the food uh, uh, allotment to ensure that Denali doesn't eat more than he should? Um, that's a behavioral issue that we have to try to solve. And, and logistically, again, even if we try to feed small amounts, Denali is right there and he is grabbing things and he is chasing other wolves away and he is um, you know, preventing them from getting their resources. So the idea of, okay, we'll just separate them. Well, when you separate them, they panic because they're not uh, with somebody or they're getting a sense that somebody else is going to be kind of waiting for them when they come out then they won't eat. Um, and so Grayson won't eat at all if you separate him. All he does is pace um, in, in the kennel and wait to come back out. And that's not healthy either. So lots of dynamics. Wolf care is not about just the physical. It's about the psychological. So I'd like to, uh, again, um, thank the, uh, I think that's Grayson there, demonstrating um, a task that I need to do in the upcoming weeks. Um, I am going to be installing the UV filter system in the pond. So we did get the pond thawed. So the water is now uh, flowing and has filled the pond. Now I need to go in this pump housing and that's what this is. This big cement thing uh, holds our UV filter system. And uh, we need to sterilize that water to control algae. And as you can see, urination in the pond is a behavior that we have. And so we will have a UV filter system that water is gonna get pumped through the UV filter system, it runs back up the enclosure to the upper pond and then cycles around. And so we have an 80 gallon per minute uh, submersible pump that circulates that water. You know, we can't stop wolves from uh, urinating in the pond, but we can hopefully try to uh, clean up uh, some of the algae and some of the uh, uh, problems that may associate with it. So we got a little excitement going on with the Arctic. So I'm not really sure who or what. Um, I'd say it's just spring. Um, they are starting to feel a little bit of different hormones. Um, that's Axel laying in wait for Grayson, a little bit of a play bow. Again, this is the summer season. This is when prolactin hormone is uh, more prominent. And even in the absence of pups, uh, we're going to see a little bit of a different change in behavior. Matter of fact, I was just, just downloaded an article the other day about social behavior. 
um, not being just a pup thing, not being a juvenile be trait. This is uh, what social carnivores do, and uh, this is the time of the year for them to do it. No doubt, it would have been amazing to have pups um, uh, join these two because I think timing would be great for pups to bring the focus again off the older wolves um, onto the younger wolves, but I can't control the circumstances what they are. I do know that the pups were whelped down at the Science Center. Peg uh, gave me a, a text yesterday and said they started the socialization process. She said they were beautiful, smoky gray pups, uh, healthy and beautiful pups. So again, uh, I hope the opportunity exists um, for a future cooperation with the Wildlife Science Center. We know that their animals are well taken care of. We know that they're medically Again, everything's done um, to the best of their abilities uh, to make sure that the health of those animals are maintained. So um, we will just see where we're at in 2021. So right now, that's Axel and Grayson. Again, Wolts and Denali up on top of the hill. I'm not worried about Denali at all. I saw him walk through. Like I say, when I got here this morning, he was pretty excited. Uh, he was wagging his tail. He has no problem with being recovered. Wolts um, had some negative conditioning from yesterday. Bolts uh, fought the immobilization. He did not go down right away. Um, he had to have a second dose before we could even leave the site. And then he got his head up. He, he sat up during part of the trip down. When I got to the clinic, I had to physically restrain him till they could give him an IV of additional meds, additional drugs to immobilize him enough for the vets felt safely uh, able to carry him into the building to go on to the exam. So, so that was a little bit of a challenge. He also did bloat a little bit of uh, coming out of anesthesia. That's always my biggest concern with these wolves. You know, when you do a dog and they say hold food for 12 hours prior to the medication to try to immobilization, uh, that's great. Uh, when we have a 1.25 acre wolf pen and I'm staring at a deer hide right here in front of me, uh, it is very challenging to hold food. So there is always a risk. Um, that's why Grizzer did not get his three year uh, immobilization this year. Uh, we felt the risk was too great for a 16 year old to put him through that. There is no physical indication that Grizzers having any issues. And so we are not going to drug him um, for any medical exams. We will obviously keep in mind how he's doing physically if we need to uh, do something. But what we found is that physically on some of these older animals when they're sick, they're actually so sick that they actually allow us to uh, draw blood uh, without immobilization. So if he does decline to the point, we are likely to still be able to get blood and urine uh, without immobilization. And so that's kind of where we're at as far as that point. So Kelly and Leanne are doing the final hay removal. Leanne crawled into that main den yesterday and I give her a ton of credit. This main den of this exhibit had straw. This was normally Joyce Wells's job. So Joyce, we missed you. Um, but it was still wet. Uh, so the back of the den uh, did not get uh, enough rock work last fall before we winter hit for us to really take care of that issue with the water draining into that den. So we are um, working on that. I've contacted the contractor to come back in to do some more rock work and we're gonna try to trench some work uh, this uh, year uh, or this spring yet and uh, try to get that solved uh, for next winter. So a couple of questions. Tony, um, sorry that, that you came in early and I didn't see that. Tony asked a question. Do you guys have a concern with the documentary, The Trouble with Wolves? Um, I am going to defer that to my colleagues. I have not seen it. I do not, uh, but I can't even tell you the last time I had time to sit down and watch um, anything, television. Um, or a movie, or um, and I have a 0.2 megabytes of upload speed at my house, so I'm not streaming anything. Um, so I'm going to defer that with my colleagues. I suspect that our communications department uh, will put out some kind of a commentary about it. I know they did with the movie The Gray. Um, so uh, uh, I uh, will wait to uh, see that. I would check our website at wolf.org. So I apologize, Tony. Apologize, Tony, another question that I cannot answer for you, um, but uh, I, I will uh, defer that to my colleagues. And actually, if you would like to email me, I could forward it on and uh, give you a direct answer to that. So uh, Michelle asked, what about vaccinations? Does Grizzers still get vaccines? Yes, um, 
So every, all the exhibit pack was vaccinated yesterday. That just makes it a little bit stress-free. But one of the benefits of socialization is we do, we do um, hand inject. And so we are able to give everybody vaccinations except bolts. I have a tough time with bolts. He's got to be in a good mood to get a vaccination. And so that's not always the easiest. So we were happy that bolts got done. Um, Grizzer will hand uh, do his vaccinations. He's very easy to vaccinate. But what I need to do for Grizzer, I need to wait till he loses some hair because I actually have to find his body um, to get um, underneath that thick, thick coat of hair he has to be able to get a subcutaneous injection. So I'm gonna wait a little bit. Um, one thing that is interesting, and my vets and I were talking about this, um, even though your dog vaccine for rabies is every three years, we vaccinate um, the uh, wolves every year for rabies. And the reason is, is that your vaccine for rabies is a dog vaccine. Here in Minnesota, our Department of Agriculture states very clearly that wolves uh, are off-label use for a dog vaccine. There's no proof, according to the USDA or the Minnesota DA, um, Department of Agriculture, that a rabies vaccine for a dog is effective with wolves. So what we do is every time we drug wolves, we draw blood. And one of the tests that we do is a rabies titer. So we look at the titer levels to see if they're truly proven to have vaccine um, capabilities. So far, everybody's had really good titers, but Grizzer, who we vaccinate rabies every year, barely has rabies protection. So for whatever reason, this wolf who is 15, 16 years old, he's had 15 vaccinations, annual vaccinations in his life, actually more than that because he had a multiple series as a pup, still barely has enough protection from rabies to feel safe if there is something that comes into his enclosure, like a squirrel or a bat or a fox or something that's rabid. So uh, that's a concern for us. So we will continue to uh, uh, connect with um, our vets on their advice, but we will continue to vaccinate. The other thing is parvo, which we would always do because that's a very, very risky disease. Uh, uh, parvovirus is lethal to pups. So we will always do a, a parvo titer anytime we get a chance for, to check our wolves. The interesting thing is we normally stop parvo at eight because it's really not an adult wolf issue. It's a pup issue. But with Denali in 2012, he had titer levels of 2,600. Uh, and again, the units are, it's just, we'll just say 2,600 units of, of titer protection against parvo. In 2017, that had dropped to 650. So we had uh, discontinued his parvo because we thought the risk factor wasn't there. But the fact that he dropped so significantly, we went back this time and gave him another parvo vaccine. First of all, because we know pups are coming, you know, again, 2021, we hope to get the pups here. Um, but we want to make sure that, that there's no risk. If pups carry it, there's no risk to our adults to get it. So, so that's kind of important. So, so Stacy is new to the site. Welcome, Stacy. Um, uh, and no apologies. Every question is, is welcome here. Uh, there is not a pack leader. She asked, is there a pack leader? Is it Tenali? Um, there's not pack leader because we don't have a female. Um, typically, even in our facility that is a non-breeding facility, meaning that we have three different subspecies. This is the Arctic right here. Bolts is the Great Plains subspecies, and Denali is the Northwestern subspecies. Um, we don't breed because captive born, captive stay. And so none of these subspecies have a release program in the wild. Arctics are not released in the wild. There's a, a game species on Arctics. Minnesota wolves, there's discussion about being um, returned to a harvest season. And the Northwestern population, obviously, there are harvest seasons in the West. So they're not candidates to be released for recovery like the red wolf or the Mexican wolf who are, uh, have a significant amount of investment to keep those populations healthy for the long term. So we manage a small exhibit for the purpose of education to show people the differences of the five subspecies in North America. So the only two subspecies we don't have are the eastern uh, subspecies or eastern wolf, which some people, the Lycoan subspecies and some Biologists are now even thinking that that's a separate wolf called an eastern wolf and not, the, not a subspecies of the gray wolf. And then, uh, again, we don't have the Mexican wolf here because it's protected. So 
Um, here's Denali representing the Northwest subspecies. So without a female to pair up, so even if we're not breeding, even if we're not, um, you know, um, producing pups here, we are, um, and when we have a female, we do have a pack structure of a pair bond of that dominant pair that kind of assumes leadership. Since we lost Luna, um, who was our last dominant female, and then um, Aiden was retired, uh, basically um, uh, we have a circumstance where we don't have any leadership because we don't have a pair bonded pair, like a male and a female. And Denali, just by his age, I think um, they look to him kind of for leadership. When there's stress, um, there is a circumstance where you might have um, an animal who's uh, a little stressed out that go to the most comforting thing in that time is the old timer. Now, when they're not stressed and they're excited, they go to the old timer to push them around. So, you know, wolves can be, um, have a lot of different behaviors that are motivated by different circumstances. But I do think I, uh, that Denali is kind of the one that they go to, um, to be able to seek some comfort. Bolts does, there's no doubt. Bolts is, is connected um, very well. So this is what you're watching is the morning chicken. Yes, Axel had a fecal there. It is not uncommon when you um, go through immobilization that there's a little bit of a loose stool. Diet was uh, disrupted. So obviously we did not have, um, it's, it's not diarrhea, it's just small and loose. Um, there's not a lot of volume of food in there. Uh, we had to hold the food uh, since Tuesday, I'm uh, sorry, since Wednesday. So we uh, did not feed at that given time. And we're again, trying to um, get as much as we can to each individual. Now, the fact that Bolts is in here is a little bit concerning to me. Um, again, I, I'm gonna need to probably do some hand uh, work with Bolts to build his confidence. Um, I don't even know where he is right now. And um, that wolf doesn't trust very many people. And as the main person who immobilized him and had a lot of the trauma with him yesterday, um, I certainly think that I might um, need to do a little bit of work to build that up. So we'll work on that. I'll go in and do wolf care after this uh, webinar and see if we can hopefully um, return some trust uh, back to bolts. We'll definitely make sure that he gets fed. So that's Denali doing some caching there. These are just small pieces of pork roast. Uh, I think it's a rump roast uh, that, that came in from a uh, uh, generous uh, farm, uh, donated it from Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Uh, we are seeing Grayson eating. Axel <laughs> likes to take a piece, see if he likes it, then drops it. Um, so uh, we uh, are definitely happy to see Grayson eating. That's one of our challenges um, is that um, Grayson doesn't get enough to eat. He's a little intimidated by Denali. Denali drives him off of the food. Um, and again, the vets want me to try to get Denali to lose 15 or 20 or 30 pounds. Um, it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge. Um, I do not want to retire Denali just to merely to put him on a diet. Um, Denali likes being part of the pack. He's got no issues being part of the pack. And even though there are some moments of less than um, quality behavior with some of his pack mates. Uh, he is right there wagging his tail. He is a part of this pack as much as anybody. So I really wanna make sure that we make the right decision for him, but I also wanna make sure that, um, again, that we can control his weight. The good thing is for him, he's very active being around these boys. He runs with them, he chases Grayson quite a bit. Um, so he gets a lot more exercise in retirement. Um, well, they're not as active. And that's one of the biggest triggers for joint stiffness is inactivity. So keeping them up, keeping them moving, walking them around, even though sometimes it might be too, look like it's too much. I always wanna judge uh, what's right for him to make sure that, you know, I don't look at one moment and make a decision. I look at multitude of moments and make a decision. So um, the question, that uh, Stacy has, oh uh, yes, uh, where is Bolts? I do not know. Um, I will have to work on that after the webinar. So Charles, uh, welcome. Charles, uh, as Axel and Grace and our brothers, is there any noticeable difference in their bond towards each other as opposed to the other wolves? That's a great question. And we've been watching this pretty closely on some of our video. Um, Grayson's getting pretty fed up with his brother's antics. Um, so um, I see a lot more attention with Grayson uh, uh, trying to avoid chin rests, uh, just uh, posturing off to Axel, trying to do a little bit of a, a I don't know what you call it, um, 
I call it tolerance, but um, uh, you know, that's a human term. I don't know what it is in a wolf term, but he's really, really seems to be struggling uh, with being the brunt of Axel's dominance. And so I think the bond is there. Um, there's no doubt. But yesterday when we had those two separated from the group, um, Grayson went towards Denali uh, when he came back out. Um, granted, he had his tail up high for a little bit, and so we had to kind of monitor that. But later on, it seemed like he there is an association with the other pack members that's equally as strong. I am very encouraged to watch Bolts and Grayson do a lot of nose-to-nose -nose greetings on the camera. So I have to think, okay, fast forward, let's say six months, and Denali's in retirement you know, Bolts is going to be out here and it's going to be Bolts and the brothers. I got to think that Grayson, who doesn't get a lot of dominance from Bolts, might start to form an alliance with Bolts um, in response to Axel. And, and that may change the dynamics for those two. So we'll kind of watch that. We've had some experience before when we retired out Wolves and we've had brothers. We had Denali and Aiden alone and the brothers can get sick of each other pretty quickly. So I think um, anyone who's probably experienced um, close proximity living, which is always the challenge in captivity. This is not natural. You know, in captivity or in the wild, you don't like your brother and you're too, you know, you can pick up and leave and go find a mate, start your own territory, have your own offspring. You know, you don't have that freedom in captivity. So it's our obligation and our ethical responsibility to these animals to really be keyed in. Uh, to what's happening uh, with those individuals. So I think that's a really good question. And let me segue into um, how we're going to manage it and where I watch the two wolves who don't need to eat the most, um, eating all the food. Um, I'm going to show you uh, um, our newest addition uh, to life here in Ely, and that is the Explore.org cameras. And so we did have an agreement last fall started and then we had winter um, so we couldn't install anything uh, but explore.org uh, and the wolf center have been working on this for a while uh, but we had the opportunity to expand cameras in our exhibit pack and so we have two cameras going on right now and um, one of the cameras is on the side of the fence that faces south at 11 o'clock to noon i believe five days a week on Explore.org site, we will have a live chat with one of us. I'm not sure who. Yeah, I'm going to close those off right now. So, so there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so the reality is, by having those extra cameras, we can see a lot more. But also by having those extra cameras, we're engaging with people who may not know our history. And so my biggest concern is uh, to make sure that we have adequate staff, that we can communicate the social dynamics that's going on with this pack. And so we can talk about Denali. Denali is not a disposable animal. I will not retire him because people think he's too stiff or he's too old or he shouldn't be out there or he's not you know, dynamic enough. Um, he sleeps too much. You know, Denali deserves better than that. So I wanna make sure that people understand Every wolf here has a value. Every wolf has a place. Um, and we um, don't make decisions based on aesthetics. We don't make decisions based on, you know, what's, what's good for viewing. We make decisions based on what's good for pack dynamics and, and how these wolves integrate. And so I will always make sure that I try to educate that. But I think that's my biggest concern. I hear a lot of that even yesterday after the medical exams. There were a lot of comments. Well, where are they? Why aren't they up? Well, you know, it's been a tough day. When you get drugged, the last thing you need to do is perform. You have to get some rest. And so I think um, I want to make sure that we're educating um, first and entertaining second. So that's a real big concern for me. So uh, Diana says uh, that she's noticed the exploit other cams are delayed from the IWC cameras. Uh, yes, that is a fact. What the explore.org camera does is it streams through YouTube. And so what that means for you as a viewer is that you have um, a smaller bandwidth, you have more ability to see um, less of that buffering. So our cameras are high res, our cameras are straight to the website. 
uh, and um, so basically what that means is anybody who's got very poor internet like I do at my house, I can't even pull up the Wolf Center cameras because they're too high res and it takes too much bandwidth. But I can pull up the Exploit Auto cameras no problem because they're compressed, they're less pixels and they're less resolution. And because they have to stream to YouTube first, there's gonna be a delay. So that makes it a little bit of challenging. I'm getting a lot of help. I'm trying to keep up on Axel Jason Ravens here. Maybe I'll just leave it uh, where it is because um, he just keeps running all over the place um, getting Ravens. But uh, the reality is um, when people, and I welcome people emailing me, uh, you can email me anytime at curator at wolf.org. If you see something on exploit out our camera, the challenge is uh, that we don't, we don't have timestamp. And so it's kind of hard for me to see what it is. If you can, if you see something on Exploit Outdoor's camera and you can go to our camera and say, it was about 9.38 uh, or something like that, that will allow me to then uh, go back and check their site. Because the other nice thing about Exploit Outdoor cameras is on YouTube, you can just drag that bar back and you can see the last 12 hours. And I think it's actually 24 hours. Um, but uh, that's a great way to be able to see what happened. And uh, many of the people who are watching Explore.org are clipping things and posting them, whether they be images or whether they be little uh, howling clips, That's which is really, really cool. So there's some great things that are happening out of that camera. So again, I've talked to them. I believe they turned down the sound. Uh, we are at a circumstance where um, Explore.org um, owns those cameras and they manage them. So I can't go into those cameras but we have talked to them about making sure they dump the uh, feed, increase the feedback filter and dump the volume. The reality is when wolves howl, you will hear them. As a matter of fact, I did a YouTube clip. I'm still doing short YouTube clips once a week for people who don't have time to watch the one hour webinars. And I was able to capture a clip of coyotes and uh, the coyote um, were yipping, like coyotes, it was a single coyote and the response of the wolves, it was actually, I think it was probably Grayson. I never saw him on camera, but I recognize that howl, that bark howl um, that replied. So if you get a chance to go to our YouTube channel, and if you're not familiar with our YouTube channel, you just go to wolf.org under our ambassadors and go to videos and you'll uh, be able to see that video. So Debbie, I'm sorry, I had the Exploit.org cameras on, so I, I apologize, some of my audio was uh, uh, missed, I guess. But uh, the chats on Explore.org, my understanding, are gonna be with Wolf Care staff. And uh, they will, uh, as well as some other members of the uh, Wolf Center uh, family here, our organization, um, I believe they will be 11 o'clock. <clears throat> I'm going to have to check. I'm, gonna leave, I'm assuming that's central um, daylight time. And uh, they will be on the explore.org site. So from 11 to 12, Monday through Friday, I believe that's what the schedule we're trying to set up. I thought they started yesterday. I was a bit busy with the exams yesterday, so I'm not really sure about that. Uh, but I guess I'll know at 11 o'clock. <laughs> um, I don't think I'm scheduled today. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, uh, tune in to explore.org, check out our cameras and see uh, who's there uh, that you can chat with them. So, so um, Charles asked, why do you think Bolts is so much shyer than the others? Uh, that goes back to Bolts' history, Charles. Uh, when we socialize wolf pups, we have uh, years and years and years of study and captivity have shown Captive wolves have a fear avoidance behavior that is inherent. So there's been studies that if you do not socialize wolf pups in the critical bonding period, the first 21 days of their lives, that they become uh, a, a fear avoidance of, of humans, of new stimuli, we call it neophobic, but they have an ingrained response that humans are negative. That's how you live in the wild. When you start bountying a, a, a species in the 1600s of Massachusetts, and you don't end until the 1970s in Minnesota, you're bound to have some innate selective behaviors for fear avoidance. So um, captive studies have even tried to raise, allow parents to raise their pups in that critical bonding period when the parents were handled and the parents trusted people. And they found by the time those wolf pups were a month old, they started to avoid people. So Bolts came to us as a 30 day old pup. So he was well beyond the socialization period. And um, that is part of his shyness. That is part of his trust issues. We've overcome a lot of it. Um, I, 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 that, that wolf is so special to me. 
uh, what he's been through and the fact that he doesn't have a trust and yet he trusts us with his life. I mean, especially for me, I'm one of the few people that I think, I mean, I know yesterday was traumatic for both of us. Um, the fact that he was struggling to give it up. He was struggling to go under a, a mobilization. Um, that's part of the issue. When you don't have a trust and you're fearful of people, you know, it's hard to let go of things. Where Denali, he just went to sleep and started snoring. Um, Denali, we got at 12 days of age. Uh, Bolts, not so much. So um, it is a challenge for us, and, and I will try to work with him to try to help him out um, as best as I can. So um, uh, so Stacy has a question. Um, um, thank you, Stacy, for the kind words. Uh, wolves always come first with us. Uh, aesthetics, uh, if you've ever seen me, you can see that's not a stretch for me. <laughs> aesthetics is not my deal. Um, you know, it's about quality of life, and that means I'm making that decision for Denali um, as best as I can. I wish Denali could talk, and I wish he could tell me what he's thinking. I wish Bolts could talk, but if I start hearing wolves talk, it's time for me to retire. But uh, at this point, um, my go-to moves are social engagement, um, uh, you know, how are they isolating themselves? Um, do they align with other wolves, even though they might have a bad moment? I mean, everybody's got a bad moment. If you have siblings, you probably had a bad moment. The reality is, even if there's a grab bite that Grayson harasses them or, you know, they're picking on them, you know, in five minutes, are they sleeping next to each other? In an hour, are they at the fence chasing a raven together? Are they tail wagging? Are they doing whatever? Those are the moments that I have to really look at. So um, that's a challenge for me. Um, but it's really a beneficial, and I really do appreciate people who are sending me stuff about cameras. Um, if you see something, and Keith points out that there was a great uh, view of Axel and Grayson on the den at 7.30, they were focused towards the explore.org cam. I'm not sure if they were looking at it or beyond. Uh, yes, Keith, that is a great comment. Um, the explore.org cams are pan, tilt, zoom. So when we talk about neophobic and new stimuli, having two more big eyes on the wall that are moving um, can still be a little intimidating for them. So um, the fact that those are moving, I'm, I'm only moving my camera maybe maybe an hour a day um, in the front. Those Explore.org cameras are moving relatively constantly. And so that's got to be something that they get used to. There's a sound to it. There's a, a panning uh, movement of that internal eye. So that's probably something that, and remember that wolves are driven by eye contact. Dogs are driven by eye contact. We're driven by eye contact. The reality is when you stare at something in a wolf world, you're invoking a challenge. So direct stare and avert gaze are two behaviors we talk about. Avert gaze means I'm not going to give you eye contact because I want to avoid a conflict. So you look at these and they're not like a regular camera that's got a big eyeball, but they're kind of like an eyeball. And I think there's a little bit of getting used to it. I know when we first put the camera up, they were like, what is this thing? And there was a lot of fear avoidance towards the front of the building. Um, now I think they're just kind of getting used to it. So it's only been really, uh, uh, I think they went live on Monday. I think we had them up last Tuesday. I uh, can't even remember now when we put them up, but uh, the reality is it's time. Time is kills all wounds. <laughs> time um, will be uh, able to get used to it. The other thing too, I think the ravens sit on top of the fence quite a bit. There's a lot of raven chasing going on this morning. And it's interesting because we didn't feed the regular uh, larger carcass feeding because of the drugging. We did not want to have a circumstance uh, where we had excess amount of food. And so we didn't feed the Tuesday night feeding. Um, and so there shouldn't be a lot of things lying around. But like we said with the medical exam, we don't know what they ate. Um, this is an acre and a quarter. We picked up as many skeletons as we could. But the reality is there's probably more skeletons in the closet up there and uh, things coming out of the snow banks, um, even though we're almost done with snow right now. Um, there's still a couple of piles of things from this winter that are still being dragged out of the, out of the weeds. So we'll, we'll always have that risk when we immobilize that we have something in somebody's system that, that creates a problem. So Steph asks, is there any news on when the center will be open for visitors? Again, I apologize. I don't have the direct uh, reading. I read an email. Um, I believe the governor's order was not, um, even though some businesses are being allowed, I think uh, we as uh, classified as museums and kind of closed space viewing are going to have a little bit more delay. I believe we're going to switch to a pattern of 
uh, where people register in advance um, so we can limit the quantity of people in the building at one time and that everything will be guided tours. And I think uh, if it's not the last week in May, I think we're looking at probably by June 1st, then, uh, making sure that we adhere to the governor's order. And more importantly, we adhere to people's safety and we adhere to staff safety. Certainly from the standpoint of wolf care staff, we can't afford to get sick. And not because we're worried about transmitting to wolves, it's we're worried about transmitting to each other and then having, you know, we need people to care for these wolves 24 hours or seven days a week, not 24 hours a day, but seven days a week. We need people to be able to interact and make sure everybody's okay, to feed Grizzard, to, you know, to check Denali, to do, you know, all the things that we need to do. And, um, you know, if we were to spread uh, to all the wolf care staff and to have a quarantine, um, that would be a real concern for me. So uh, Beth asked, what was said about the diagnosis to why he can't do a higher howl? We do not know. Um, I am waiting on a lot of biopsy reports. So if you're new to this organization, we discovered about two years ago, Boltz, who's a six-year-old wolf, uh, has the inability to have any high-pitched howls. He basically has a circumstance where he can howl in a low-throated tone. He growls just fine. Um, but he can't howl in a high-pitched tone. We've experienced that with our older animals, but not our younger animals. So the, that's, you know, at that time, we, went, we, we, again, couldn't just drug him and take him to the clinic uh, without doing a whole pack of mobilization. And so the parameters, again, everything's risk versus benefit. The risk assessment was, well, he's eating, he's swallowing, he appears healthy. Uh, let's check him at the next medical exam. And so that was a, we have a three-year, USDA protocol and medical exam. So we brought him in and there's nothing in his, there's no mass in his throat. That's kind of what we were thinking. Maybe there's a mass that's pushing pressure on the vocal cords. There's nothing. So that's a good thing. We know he got stung and, we, and we're trying to think, uh, you know, he got stung by something, you know, wasp, hornet, bee, we don't know what, but he bit it and he got stung. We remember his, his muzzle being swollen up maybe there was some kind of an effect from that being stung years ago. Well, we don't know. Um, so there's a few more diagnostic things they've done. Um, the bigger concern we have is that gum uh, line. Um, I showed earlier that picture, and I can go back, I think most of you saw it, that pink in his gum, the concern is that that could be related to some kind of a, of a cell growth, um, which could be a cancerous issue. Um, and what if it is, it's a slow growing issue. So a biopsy was taken and we're going to uh, be able to see that. So that's our biggest concern. But at this point, nothing with his throat. Um, and again, we may not be able to even solve that. So Stacy has a basic question. Are the volunteer handler taught when they go in where the wolf, uh, where with the wolves behavior wise? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, we have a very uh, uh, strict protocol about training we have tier levels. Level three is the most experienced handlers. Kelly on top of the pump housing is a level three handler. Leanne is a level two handler. That's the next level of handler. And then a level one, people that are just starting or people that um, have different responsibilities outside of the enclosure um, have that tier level one. So with that training, definitely immobilization, definitely monitoring pulse temp respiration. Behavior is huge. So we have what's called an ethogram. We mirrored it after Wolf Park, another facility in Battleground, Indiana, who's been a very co great console facility for us. Um, this ethogram is a dictionary of behaviors. And first and foremost, our staff have to understand behaviors before they walk in the pen. And the other thing that they have to understand is that wolf behavior is not something that you can dictate um, just because something happened last week doesn't mean the same wolf's going to do the same thing this week. So it, it depends upon the alliances. So you have to watch. And the biggest thing we train is what's called situational awareness. So when I come in in the mornings, uh, first thing I look for is every wolf. I, I get a, what I call a heads up, a head count. Where are you? And then I look at what are you doing? How are your ears? Uh, what's your tail posture? I knew right away. I knew last night from the camera that um, you know, at, when that thunderstorm rolled in, I saw Bolts and I knew Bolts was having not the greatest of day. Not only had been drugged, um, he'd been traumatized because the drug didn't make him go down or he fought the drug. And so um, I, he had to be restrained uh, to be able to get more IV drug. 
And then he comes back, and Axel gives him a little bit of grief. When Axel comes out, he's not feeling the greatest. Denali's not that comforting because Denali doesn't feel that great. And then we have wind, which Bolts hates. And then you throw a lightning storm onto the board boy, added to the fact that he's already weak in socialization. You know, I'm lucky that he's even shown up. Um, so um, we'll work on it. I, I can, you know, I've been through Bolts trauma before, and I've, um, you know, I can, I can hopefully try to help him out of this one. Um, it may be a few days. So that is something that staff, I would say the biggest training is you need to be aware of everything. You need to be aware of every circumstance and situation awareness is how we, how we title it, train it. Boy, that's tough. It's almost an ingrained skill, uh, meaning that you either have it and you're, you know, that's your personality trait to pay attention to detail or you don't. So Kelly there, standard example, checking the water to make sure it's full, make sure that there's no issues with it. We have uh, separate waters in the enclosure, make sure that they're washed out. They're looking for wolves. They're identifying who's lying with who. Uh, you know, again, uh, looking for bolts. Everything is paired up in here for their own safety. And um, that's a, a huge part of what we do. So I think that's a real big, uh, a big component. So the wolves are up the hill. I will not view the exploit.org cameras um, to see them, but you can um, join our website and check them out. Um, uh, but uh, there is a, um, certainly a, um, uh, a, a chance, I would say, to pick up the boys on the north camera, the camera facing north over on this hillside by the den. I, I suspect that they're probably up back there is where they're lying down. So Greta asked, uh, did the vet say anything about Denali's condition? And how concerned are you with bol about bolts? If it's an inflammation, um, uh, it should be possible to treat. Uh, yes, well... Uh, uh, first of all, Denali's condition, uh, Denali, when he went to the clinic yesterday, Denali has a body chart and the body chart is something that the wolf care staff do. Uh, they identify, uh, abnormalities, they chart them because his brother Aiden had mast cell tumors that started out with little pea sized growths that, uh, materialized into bigger, uh, tumors. We map Denali's body for growths. And so... When Denali went to the clinic, his clipboard went with and his body chart with all the growths we've been mapping. And those date back to when did we start seeing them? How big did they advance? Um, the biggest concern we have with Denali is on the left side of his body, he has a mass that started as an avocado in 2019 that is now the size of almost like a grapefruit. That one was biopsied yesterday. That's concerning uh, That because uh, it's slow growing, which typically for us, slow growing masses are could be fatty cysts, although it doesn't have the consistency of a fatty cyst. And the good thing is it's not in the abdominal cavity, it's subcutaneous. So it means it's between the rib cage and the skin. It's not coming from the abdomen. Um, so that's less of a concern. That biopsy is gonna, um, require me to make a lot of decisions um, when that one comes back on, on what that level is. So uh, with Bolts's lip, uh, again, um, if it is cancer, we know that it's slow growing and uh, there is much we can do um, with that. Uh, if it is something, it's likely to be something that's within the jaw. So uh, we will keep you posted. As a matter of fact, I have a webinar in June. Um, I had to change my Welcome Pup webinars and um, the June webinar I selected uh, will be um, reviewing the medical exams for all of our wolves. So I'll have much more details at that time. You can check our website at wolf.org to be able to um, impact, uh, to be able to see that. So Susan asked, will there be an effect on behind the scenes programs um, or is the group side within the guidelines for social distancing? Uh, yes, so we do a behind the scenes program starting June 5th on Fridays. Uh, it used to be 20 people. It is now 10 people. When people have to pre-register for that, we'll look at social groups of families. Uh, we will walk people up um, outside the building so they come, um, they stay outside. We will have areas positioned, exhibit versus retired. So we'll split people up and uh, we will have the uh, wolf care staff all on board. I still have to be very clear about um, doing these programs. I am uh, one of those people that has underlying health conditions um, that um, create a high risk for me to be exposed to COVID-19. 
So I am not sure if I will be um, doing uh, the behind the scenes program. I'm still gonna have to work that out. Maybe I can do it from a mask uh, and be inside the enclosure six feet away. Uh, we'll worry about that. But uh, yes, we will continue to do those programs, but they will be pre-register and a cap of 10 people is what we know. So Beth asked, is there one wolf in particular that always greets you when you enter the enclosure? Um, I would say Axel, but it's not in the way that you would think. Um, Axel greets me because Axel continually tests me. Um, Axel is uh, the wolf that is, has the most exuberant behavior and um, it is very common for wolves to test. If you watch wolf video over and over again, when wolves are out hunting and they may be separated from each other and they come back, um, immobilizing the, uh, you know, uh, when they come back, you know, the testing is, is constant. So in other words, uh, two wolves go off hunting, they come back, the pack says, oh, you were number two and number three, are you still number two, number three, or can I take your place? So there's all kinds of this dynamic testing that goes on. Part of it's the ecology of wolves because they are social pack animals. So what I've noticed from Axel in the last year, um, he's very focused on my left elbow. In December, I had part of my bone removed from my left elbow due to osteoarthritis. Um, just 35 years of working in wolf care along uh, with metal fences and cold weather, uh, basically my joints are shot. He, he knew about it long before my doctor did. And so since I had the surgery, he's constantly going after that elbow. So when he greets me, it's about testing more than anything. So I have to remind him, yes, I still, I have a bad elbow, but yes, I can still be more assertive. And so I basically roll him over and we're good. So um, Grayson tries to greet me socially, but often gets blocked by Axel. So the competition issue is a big challenge we have in wolf care. And that's the biggest issue I have, why I think the cameras are important because the, the human dynamic in wolf care makes it a challenge for us to really see what's going on with the wolves because the humans, uh, posturing for attention is a real big competition issue. So that's where I, I, get, I can kind of best um, uh, answer that. So uh, there's a question, are possibly cancerous growths experienced often in wild wolves? I would say it's very hard to uh, determine that. First of all, um, the lifespan of a wild wolf, your chances of reaching eight or 10 years of age is very, very slim. You know, the mortality of pups is, can be as great as 40 to 50% then you're a chance to make it to five is probably less than 5%. You know, um, the reality is there's a lot of mortality in the wild. So I think a lot of these geriatric issues are captive issues. And certainly something that um, can be said about nutrition, you know, um, uh, there's a matter of fact, there's a webinar the New York Wolf Center is putting on um, next week. And I'm not sure if I'll be able to get it, but there's a really good study going on about gut uh, biotic uh, gut enzymes in the diet of captive wolves and how important that is to health. So we try to feed roadkill deer and beaver their natural diets to try to keep their gut enzymes as clear, as close to the wild as possible. But we do know that there's, you know, probably something, you know, to be said about captive life stress, um, you know, that might be adding to some things as well as just the fact that it's age related. So Betty asked, we got a couple more and I'll wrap up here. Betty asked, are the biopsies sent to the University of Minnesota? Matter of fact, uh, we are using a diagnostics lab in Michigan for our rabies, so they are not um, sent to the U of M, even though our bodies of our wolves that have passed on are sent to the U of M for necropsies just from the standpoint of transport. Uh, but we have other uh, uh, diagnostic labs that we have worked with over the years uh, that have our histories. And so they're the ones that are doing uh, a lot of our diagnostics. So Debbie asked, why was the mass of Denali not removed when they had them immobilized? Um, First of all, we don't know if it's benign, there would be no reason to uh, remove it. Second of all, keep in mind, if we would have taken Denali out to take a mass off that we didn't know needed to be taken off, he would have been out of that pack. So you can't not make that moment decision that will impact the rest of his life unless you are certain that that decision needs to be made. So again, we would not have been able to re reunite him with the pack um, after that um, kind of a longer surgery, uh, more invasive incision. So uh, we will make that choice uh, for him um, at a later time. Uh, once we get the biopsy back, we'll understand better what we're dealing with. If it is benign and it has no impact on his health, um, then uh, we don't usually go um, on 
the side of doing invasive work that's not necessary. So those will be decisions that we'll make for him at that time. So Grizz's teeth are great. His abscess problem is um, taken care of. He's eating chicken thighs again, crunching them. As a matter of fact, um, during the immobilization yesterday, I gave him part of a deer rib. Did you guys find that, by the way? Any sign of a deer rib in Grizzer's pen? No. So the wolf care staff did not find it. So I believe uh, Grizzer's teeth issues are over. We had three bouts of antibiotics this winter. Seemed to take care of it. So I, um, and um, I miss, um, I, I miss the, uh, um, old days when girls used to sit on a deer or uh, beaver carcass uh, just like Denali did. Uh, so hopefully we'll kind of return to some of that in the last stages of his life. So Donna asked, are these webinars only done monthly? So these free webinars are done every week on Fridays until we open to the public. So I will continue probably two more this month. Uh, but our regular scheduled program revenues that have a subscription, meaning you can subscribe to the year, we do usually 14 a year. Um, so we are heavy on the birthdays. Uh, so every wolf gets their birthday, except this year we merged uh, Axel Grayson and Grizzard because they're only three days apart. But uh, we do try to do them on a regular schedule, monthly schedule. Next year, if we get pups, uh, we will have more um, because we do a lot of stage uh, of, of values for the uh, webinars when we do pups, meaning, you know, this is where they're at this stage when we get them and then how they grow so quickly. So we'll be probably doing them every couple of weeks then. But at this point, uh, we will continue to do these Friday webinars. We also have a, a YouTube channel. So if you have the ability to watch our YouTube channel, and I'll just go back to again, uh, wolf.org um, on our website. If you're not familiar with our YouTube channel, if you go to our website, you go to Our Wolves, you're gonna see the word videos here. And these are our video channel. And this is what I put together. Um, actually, one of our uh, webcam watchers, our night owls, um, emailed me and said, hey, there was a ruckus. It was a dog barking um, excessively. The wolves got excited and um, you should check this out. It happened at 9.15, 9.30 on the 12th. So I went back to our cameras and I was able to hear it's a coyote that's yipping and Grayson and Axel. So I'll try to keep doing those smaller, shorter YouTubes, keep them three or four minutes for people to watch. Um, and I will, again, like I said, do these webinars. And then the next webinar will be, matter of fact, I can look it up on our website. If I go to programs, go to webinars and lectures, I believe it is, we have a lot of great kids stuff going on, free webinars for kids. Um, we have another broadcast of Biologist Webinar, Returning of Elk to Minnesota with Mike Schrag. That's a, that'll be a cool program. Mike's a great guy. Uh, but June 18th, I'm going to do Assessing the PAC's Medical Needs, and by then I should have all of the information uh, available as um, far as uh, this medical exam and be able to talk about where we're at with everything. So thanks again for watching. Appreciate your support during all of this. And we will, uh, again, see you next week, Friday.